afternoon and welcome to de Havilland's latest live stream video. I'm Rebecca Evans, Director of Content at de Havilland and this afternoon we're going to be talking about last week's ministerial reshuffle, what it might mean for the development of policy for the rest of this year and what the implications could be for public affairs professionals um, working with the new government or trying to. Um, I'm delighted to be joined by Gutto Harry. Senior Advisor at Hanover Communications and formerly Director of External Affairs for Boris Johnson in his first term as Mayor. Indeed. And Daniel Hamilton, Conservative Commentator and Managing Director at FTI Consulting. Welcome. So last week we obviously had quite a few new ministerial appointments, Cabinet Ministers, perhaps not as radical as was being uh, predicted a few weeks ago, um, but still quite a few new faces. Um, of those who are new, Who's particularly caught your eye? Who do you think could be interesting in policy terms? I think the Chancellor's got to be number one, isn't it? And uh, we might get back to the specifics of the Chancellor. But if you just imagine that the right are meant to be, the Conservatives are meant to be the reactionary party. But if you think the only party in modern Britain has had two Prime Ministers who are female, that can effortlessly switch from the first Muslim Chancellor to the first Hindu um, Chancellor that can have the diversity not only ethnically but in gender and all that on, on, on the front bench of the cabinet but also geographically. So I think that Rishi uh, is interesting for so many reasons which we get onto but the fact that he represents a constituency in the north of England is you know the geographical diversity that eluded Jeremy Corbyn completely where virtually everyone in his top team is not only from London but from Islington. Although arguably there were some, there were some mentions around the, the gender split, weren't there, and whether that could have been better. Rishi perhaps accepted, but uh, Daniel, what about you? I think whenever there's a reshuffle, there's lots of focus on, you know, who are the big sparkly people with the, the top jobs. Mm -hmm. And clearly most of the coverage focused on the appointment of the new Chancellor. It's only logical he controls the policy portfolio that will be absolutely crucial in terms of delivering the government's agenda on infrastructure spending, mm -hmm. in terms of rebalancing things away from London and the South East. But... I think from a public affairs professional perspective, it's always more interesting to me to look at the junior and mid ranks in terms of any reshuffle. A couple of things I picked up on there. Firstly, you see far more gender diversity. Mm -hmm. Clearly, yeah, right the way back from David Cameron's election in 2010, right to the present day, we see far more women in prominent positions in cabinet. And as Gitto mentioned, we now see the diversity in cabinet of leading voices like Priti Patel, the Home Secretary, who's really driving home a very tough and I think amongst the public popular law and order message. But if you look further down the ministerial ranks, you see the continued advancement of eloquent, forceful ministers like Caroline Dynage, like Vicky Ford, who's just joined mm -hmm. the government, like Victoria Atkins. And as we head towards the next election, I think these are the people we should be keeping an eye on because they will be the broadcast face but also the policy face of the party going forward. So that's what I was going to ask, really, in terms of new people, but actually thinking about diversity. For public affairs professionals, what does that, that, that the, the different kinds of diversity likely to mean in terms of policy or the, the interaction they might have? I think one of the striking things about Boris, people sometimes talk about him as a, as a loner. Mm -hmm. he's, he's not a loner, he can get on with everybody, but he didn't have this whole network despite going to Eton like so many other Prime Ministers, didn't have this network of Notting Hill friends who were about to take over every aspect of the state. So half the people are now hugely prominent, the people he barely knew a few years ago. I don't think he'd even met Rishi till, you know, he's back in Parliament. That's the last five years, whereas David Cameron had, you know, a whole bunch of people ready to move in to run the country because they'd been planning it for 30 odd years. Mm -hmm. Um, so that means that people who are climbing the ranks, which you highlight brilliantly, are people worth investing in now getting to know because they will and they will advance on merit because it's not a clique. It is one where I think the key test will be how people deliver, how they perform, uh, because, you know, in the end, all glory goes to the fear of Boris used to joke, but most of the sort of uh, the, the visible side of the government will inevitably go back to him and a couple of others. And do we think now that the cabinet and the, and the ministers mm -hmm. are, are quite aligned in policy terms? I mean, do we think they're all going to be singing from the same hymn sheet going forward? Well, I think we will, but I think it's important to remember, if we go back to the time of the leadership election or just a few weeks before Boris Johnson announced his candidacy to succeed Theresa May, his only real parliamentary champions were Jake Berry and Ben Wallace. They were the only real people that were willing to stick their head above the parapet and actually say they were supporting and him. Adams. And Nigel Adams, of course. <laughs> but actually, if you look at what you have now and you look at Boris basking in the post-election glow, you have a whole new 
set of converts, loads of people around the cabinet table in the junior ministerial ranks who are essentially trying to communicate as much loyalty to Boris as possible. And I think if we look over the, the next couple of years, certainly, it really is Boris's will that will win the day. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think that's mirrored across the appointments right across the cabinet. These are people who are advancing on merit. These are people who are representing all parts of the UK. And there's often a criticism, I think, of Boris where people say, is he really serious about taking the Conservative Party beyond being a South East of England focused political party? I think just look at his term of Mayor of London, where actually he was really quite counterintuitive for a Conservative mayor in terms of the kind of groups and demographics that he spoke to, even in terms of some of the policies mm. that he pushed. He looked at new areas. And I think that the, the promotion of a large number of women, the promotion of a large number of members of Parliament from North of England constituencies shows that he means business. He wants to diversify the Conservative Party's brand. And that's what the Cabinet appointments show. So what do we think will be the, the policy focuses? And perhaps, I mean, you just alluded to things that might be unexpected. Where are areas that people might not be anticipating, but you think there might be um, scope, again, thinking about public affairs people, where they might want to think, oh, actually, there might be some activity there. I was there. Sorry to say what people may have anticipated. <laughs> I mean, infrastructure, he loves it. Yeah. Um, he was... He had the final say on planning as Mayor of London, and there's nothing that would light up his eyes more than to have an architectural model brought in. And he would look at it, and even look at how many trees were along the, the problem, and whether there's a bike there, whether there's a Boris bike or not. But the big thing is, there was a huge expansion in the London skyline. There's mm -hmm. a lot of building, there's a lot of exciting yes. stuff happened. Um, he talked about a Thames Estuary airport. Everybody thought it was a joke until I remember going out on a dredger into the estuary with a bunch of engineers <laughs> who had built floating airports in Tokyo and in and in Hong Kong, I think. And um, they thought it was an absolutely brilliant idea. And then, you know, um, prominent architects started saying this is a great idea. So it's worth watching behind the immediate clown sort of pronunciations of Boris. There's usually serious intent. So on infrastructure, what could that look like then? I mean, obviously HS2. we've already talked about yeah, HS2. Never, never in any doubt who's going to do HS2. And therefore, if you look at other things like the tidal barrage proposed in Swansea Bay, mm -hmm. if you look at new nuclear power stations, if you look at you know, things elsewhere, his natural inclination will be, we want, I want to do this. And if he's told it can't be done, and he used to cite Margaret Thatcher to me, imagine the number of people who told her, you can't dig a, a tunnel under the, yeah. under the channel to France, don't be mad. It took somebody with a stubborn self-belief to say to all the people with this cosy received wisdom, no, you shut up, you go off to the maths again, find a different accountant, find a different engineer. I think he's going to want to do a lot of building. The bridge to Scotland, you think we'll see that? I can't see that. Um, <laughs> I mean, Not quite flying, that far. I'm still thinking of the airport, but, but you know, I'm sure it's doable in engineering terms. I just, you know, I happen to live uh, in a part of London where the bridge is down across the river, and there are more people who cross Hammersmith Bridge, I mm -hmm. think, that would use that bridge from that part of Scotland to that part of Ireland. But other infrastructure. And, and from yeah. what you're saying, potentially picking up projects that actually, like the, the tidal bay that... Yeah, that haven't, haven't been talked about sure for a while. That the Thames Estuary Airport is dead and buried. Oh, really? We'll see. No, I think, I think, I mean, look, there's, Gitto obviously mentioned some of those big ticket ideas, you know, the Thames Estuary Airport, um, you know, HS2. But I think actually there's some far more, you know, sort of bread and butter issues that mm -hmm. the government will get to grips with. If you look at many of the seats the Conservative Party gained, whether it's in North West Durham, whether it's in Haywood and Middleton, seats the party had never won before. Those seats have got very active members of Parliament now that are calling for simple things like bypasses, like more house building, like connections from parts of Durham into the um, Newcastle metro area, for example. And I think we'll see much more of a willingness under this government to invest in local infrastructure, particularly in the north of England, because the Boris understands one thing. It's that they have a golden opportunity now to push beyond what they're calling that red wall. They've taken some seats. There are scores of other constituencies across the northwest and the northeast where with a very small swing at the next election the conservatives could make more inroads and if they're shown to keep their promise to invest whether that's in transport or housing or other forms of infrastructure then it could be game on at the next election for more conservative gains so what do we think about the fact that housing is now not in cabinet and the northern powerhouse minister is now not got its own sort of person it's gone back to grant shaps given what you've just said what sort of signal is that Sending and from a public affairs perspective, mm -hmm. does that represent a sort of lost opportunity yeah. in terms of influence? I don't. I think if you look at who has he's chosen to appoint as housing minister, there are few members of parliament closer than Chris Pincher to Boris Johnson. He has been a very successful fixer for him over the years. And if Boris 
to choose Chris Pincher for that role, I think shows a real commitment to, to getting the job done. So you have somebody there who carries Boris's authority mm -hmm. inside government, um, who represents and has built up a marginal West Midlands constituency into a very safe seat. And he's done that, I think, by understanding the importance of greater transport connections across the West Midlands region. You've got somebody there who I think will drive forward the agenda. Similarly, when you look at the Northern Powerhouse agenda, Simon Clark, um, an MP on Teesside, he has worked very closely with Ben Houchen, the Conservative mayor of Teesside, who's delivered a new airport, who's looking at introducing free ports. And if you're looking really at a policy laboratory for how the Conservative Party will approach the north of England and the kind of economic development measures they could introduce, then looking at the Teesside region that Simon Clark is steeped in is a really good place to start. I think over time as well, the whole concept of the Northern Powerhouse thinks that it presupposes the north of England is somewhere else, that so you put in a little box and you brand it and you, you do a few token gestures that keeps it happy. If Boris gets this right, if the Conservative Party and British government is recalibrated effectively, we won't be talking about the Northern Powerhouse, we'll be talking about infrastructure. We won't assume that infrastructure only happens in the South East of mm -hmm. England. We'll be talking about economic growth. And we won't assume that all economic growth is in the South East of England with a drip drip effect elsewhere. So it's trying to stop us thinking of the North of England as a little place in a box with a tokenistic kind of attention given to it every now and then by one tokenistic minister. And it should be front of heart and mind, as should my native Wales, as should Scotland's a different one. Scotland's tough, but yeah, that's another issue maybe. Okay, we'll come on to that in a minute maybe. Um, well, let's talk about the Chancellor for a little bit. Um, in terms of he, he, the, the man himself, he's got, you know, three weeks to, to put his budget together, or maybe it isn't his, I mean, discuss, I suppose. But um, that process is obviously well in train. And then there are other opportunities, you know, later around comprehensive spending review and so on. In terms of influence, what, what can we expect from Rishi Sunak? I'm told, you know, the, the, the very words from somebody extremely close to Boris was class act, um, who'd also predicted that a punch up or said that a punch up with his predecessor, Sajid Javid, had been coming for a long okay. time. Um, deep down, I don't think, brutal that is, that the Prime Minister ever really rated Sanjay Javid as much as he would want to rate the man or the woman, if it happened to be a woman in this case. Boris is ge genuinely colourblind in that sense. Um, I think he thinks he's just got a classier Chancellor. He's got somebody who's intellectually top draw, that he respects, uh, that represents a constituency in the north of England, that has the track record out there in the big bad world of taking decisions that are tough. And the idea that somehow somebody of that intellectual calibre with that back, uh, track record has been given the job because he's malleable or will do what he's told is, is patently ridiculous. But what we have now is a Chancellor who is aligned with the Prime Minister, but also strong enough to stand up to him. And the key test for Boris will be, does he deliver? And if he delivers down the line when Boris has moved on in 10, 15, 20 years, as he would say, maybe before if he doesn't get it right, um, then obviously we have a, another candidate now to be very, very interesting future leader of the Conservative Party. But I'd be shocked if we see any, you know, any sort of tiny little bit of ankle shown on that in the foreseeable future. OK. Yeah, I think he's going to show extreme loyalty to Boris for the next few weeks. But I think the, the biggest challenge the new Chancellor has is developing a retail offering mm -hmm. to continue the momentum the Conservative Party has had in the last few months. I mean, you hear the reports all the time that Boris has banned the use of the word Brexit. Um, but the problem to date is it's been a word that has really dominated his leadership campaign and the first few months of his premiership. It's the real challenge, I think, for the Chancellor, and it's the first opportunity the government really has to do this, is to show actually how can they develop policies which appeal to Middle England, to exactly the kind of voters who deserted the Labour Party and appealed to the Conservatives at the last election. Where I think there may be some tension, and this may particularly impact upon the Conservatives' more traditional support base in affluent parts of London and in the South East, is in that effort to rebalance the economy, does Boris and does the Chancellor choose to you know, hit pensions, for example? Mm -hmm. Do they choose to look at marginal tax increases on um, certain types of property? This is something that could enrage traditional supporters, but could well deliver the kind of revenue that the Chancellor needs, that many Secretaries of State need, to deliver that infrastructure we've just spoken about. OK. And what about, um, what about the, the advisers, that, that centralised advisory team, number 10 and number 11, working together? Um, there's obviously been a, a lot of talk about it. From a, from a public affairs point of view, does that open up opportunities in terms of influence or access, or does it, does it narrow them down because there's one team instead of, instead of two? Well, I think instinctively one of the issues when you do public affairs is you 
have great conversations and a fantastic relation with one person, then you realize that they are countered by somebody who feels differently uh, or they're not as central as you think. I think the, the advantage of centralization for all the you know disadvantages in terms of political theory and all the rest, but the advantage is, is if you speak to a SPAD at the moment, you know that SPAD is plugged into Dominic Cummings who thinks he's running the country and to a, a certain extent, but it's obviously massively exaggerated is. So every SPAD, um, matters now, I think. And if you look at a joint team in number 10, you're not speaking to somebody on the fringes of government, you're speaking to somebody who, when they agree to something, has the authority, I think, to, to mean what they say. Yeah, I agree. And I think, I think there's nothing to be scared of in terms of this joint team. I think has been rightly pointed out over the last few weeks. Um, David Cameron and George Osborne operated the closest possible, possible relationship between the two of them. And actually, I think that led to a far more harmonious period of government between the Chancellor and the Prime Minister. I think the thing I'd also say about Boris's team, which I think stands in pretty sharp contrast to the previous administration and to Theresa May, is he actually has some people in Downing Street, you know, like Eddie Lister, who was formerly his Chief of Staff at City Hall, that really get the nitty gritty of infrastructure, of transport, of planning big projects. And I think those people really instinctively understand business far more. And any public affairs consultant going to Downing Street, speaking to a particular SPAD, we need to make sure, I think, more than ever, that our business case, our stats, the arguments that we're making are bulletproof because Downing Street will see through anything that doesn't hold water. OK, and what are the areas they might be particularly interested in? You've mentioned Dominic Cummings, Eddie Lister. I mean, what are, what are, the, what are the areas they might be most open to approaches or new ideas or, or supporting, you know, supporting information? One of the things the Prime Minister is famous for is wanting to have his cake and eat it. Um, so he does, when you translate that to something serious, he wants the investments that he makes to work hard. Mm -hmm. So he doesn't want to pump in money into the NHF if it all just dissipates or gets sucked up in bad administration. So I think with people like Matt Hancock, who I know Eddie Lister has huge respect for, and I think may have even you know thought of him as the initial Chancellor, um, they look at someone like that who understands technology, who is in a big spending department and sort of is very wise as to how technology can help us make that money go further. And also how by, you know, taking a slight deviation, mm -hmm. no more, no, nothing dramatic and ideological, but a slight deviation from the rigorous kind of or straitjacket of, of the European Union, that we can do things slightly differently. So I think, you know, uh, food, agriculture, aquaculture, could be a sort of an interesting area where there's just a little bit of liberalisation. Drugs, just a little bit. Nothing that would enable anyone to say that we are less stringent than anyone else, but maybe we, we sneak ahead of the game. I think that's that's the kind of thing that captures Boris never... I don't think he ever gave a speech where he didn't mention the penicillin was invented in Prade Street, which is just <laughs> up the road from where we are now. So that modern equivalent of that is something that he wants to boast about when he is the chief cheerleader for UK PLC. Yeah, I fully agree. And I think the, the kind of things when you're speaking to SPADs at the moment is they're incredibly receptive to good ideas. And what I'm constantly getting from a business perspective is they're saying, right, you've got this great client's idea. The client's got an idea about how they can put us in the vanguard of the UK in a certain aspect of pharma regulation or in terms of a piece of regulation looking at cryptocurrencies. If business has good ideas, if they have a good regulatory model, um, if they have something that can really make us the Singapore of Europe, and by that a well-regulated, open, free market system, then Downing yeah, Street's no willing to listen. Gum on the oh, pretty, indeed. <laughs> Not to mention buggers. No. And what? And what's the best way in if they've got those sorts of ideas? Or you know, I mean, is it is it direct to spads? Is it you know? How, how do you get to Eddie Lister or Boris via Eddie Lister or Boris via Dominic Cummings? It's a step back, I think, before you even <laughs> take that route. Um, as I've mentioned. There's no space at the moment, I think, for half-cooked ideas. There's no space for things that don't have solid economic analysis, don't have examples of how they've worked overseas, and don't show how they could actually genuinely not only create jobs in the UK, but create jobs across the UK. So I think get your basics right, mm -hmm. get your stats in order, and only when you're confident of your case and confident of your spokesman in terms of the business that you want to put forward should you make contact. SPADs are always a, a great first step. Make sure you get to know them um, and approach them with solid things that can make their job easier. That's the best way in. OK. And um, thinking about people who perhaps lost their jobs or just the general shape of the, the party, we've obviously got this huge majority. We've got um, some continuity and some new ministers. 
you know, interesting seeing the response to the ideas being floated around the BBC, for example, at the weekend, where you were starting to hear some um, some Conservative MPs say, oh, you know, and also um, about the advisor this week. Are, are there certain areas where, um, for people who, who um, are interested in policy, where they maybe don't like the look of the direction it's going, that there are other groups within the Conservative Party that it would be worth talking to, or that they, they might want to watch what happens? I think you'd have better ideas than me on, on specific people, but one of the things I would caution is not to sort of be blinded by, you know, the the uh, overbearing prominence at the moment of Dominic Cummings. So some people predict he will crash and burn mm. in the next few months. And even if he doesn't, we've just seen on two massive yeah. judgment calls that he was the wrong side of the argument or the opposite side of the argument to the Prime Minister. So yes, of course he's got the Prime Minister's ear, but the Prime Minister listens to a lot of people. And in the end, he's got really, really strong political instincts and antennae in itself. On the BBC, on that matter, no matter how many ideologues around him saying smash the BBC, Boris is essentially not tribal. He doesn't get football. He doesn't understand this idea that I'm the blue team and you're the red team and I hate you because of that. Um, he doesn't want to smash the BBC. He cares about his legacy and he knows that historians tend to be, you know, a certain political persuasion maybe, that, you know, the commentary tend to be. He doesn't want his political obituary, nor indeed his final obituary, nor the history books to be written by people who loathe him because he destroyed a cultural institution that they love. So take with a massive pinch of salt whatever the Taliban in, in, in number 10 are sort of, you know, projecting at the moment, because behind them lies a man, you know, who, who reads a lot, who thinks a lot, and doesn't want to smash things up. He is a conservative after all. I think, I think also when you look at the BBC question, it's been blown, I think, out of all proportion in the last few, last few days. John Whittingdale, who's been appointed as the Minister of State who will deal with the BBC yes. reform, um, is somebody who actually, despite the, the bluff and bluster which the, you've seen in the papers, is somebody who does believe in public service broadcasting. Mm -hmm. Now, there may be some reforms to the licence fee. There may be some elements of BBC services, particularly some of the online services, some of the um, potentially more you know, radio-based services that are reviewed. But I think the government will remain pretty committed to the idea of the BBC. And I think you certainly, when you look at policies right the way across government, when you do hear some of these more radical smash and burn elements and, and rumours that we hear, I think actually you see that Boris is still a pragmatist. He's somebody who, as mayor of London, never went for policy extremes. It was always increments. It was always, in some respects, throwing ideology out of the window. He was willing to be more social democratic at times in terms of opposing, for example, some of the government's um, you know, bedroom tax policies, for example. So I think actually you have mm -hmm. a pragmatist there, and I don't think he's going to smash the BBC. And I'd echo that because John Whittingdale knows this area, this whole industry, inside out. He knows newspapers inside out. And if you want Boris's view of the BBC, just generally tend to, and also the internet giants, look at look at them in newspapers mm -hmm. and what their agenda is, because he's essentially a sort of inky-fingered man. But they don't want to smash the BBC in the end. I mean, John Whittingdale, I think, used to talk about putting the BBC back in its box, not sort of breaking it into tiny mm -hmm. little pieces, mm -hmm. just reining it in a little bit. And who was a spad to John Whittingdale not that long ago, who's now a sort of super spad uh, with benefits, shall we say, uh, in number 10, but a certain Carrie Simmons? Yes, OK. Um, one final area that I'd like us to just touch on before we uh, run out of time altogether. Um, we've got now got a, joy, a, a minister, a Secretary of State in terms of Bayes, Alok Sharma, but mm -hmm. he's also president of um, COP26. Mm -hmm. um, what's your view around the balance of those two roles for a start? Is it possible to do both and do both well? Mm -hmm. what, what do we think the focus might look like? Well, look, I'm, I think he's a pretty good appointment. Um, Worked with Alok a number of times over the years, um, right from the start when he was uh, the Conservative parliamentary candidate for Reading West to his rise right up through the ministerial ranks. And a couple of general observations about him. He is right across the detail, mm -hmm. but he balances that extremely well with an immense sense of personal charm. And I think it's been correctly pointed out that when you look at the COP summit, it's a very political task. Mm -hmm. It's going to require building relationships with people, some tough decisions, some late nights. And I think, frankly, he's got the uh, mix of policy detail, but also charm necessary to pull that off. So when it comes to the cop role, I think Alok's the right guy to do it. And I think business will find somebody there that is um, interested, curious, but also wants to go far further in government. And if he can pull this off, it seals, I think, a very rosy political future. 
I'd agree with that. And the only thing I would add is that it's been a source of great frustration to the Prime Minister that the climate change agenda for too long has been associated with the left and with self-denial, mm -hmm. with some things that we have to give up in order to make what we have last a little bit longer. He sees climate change as an enormous opportunity mm -hmm. to be seized, to, to build business, the business of you know, solar panels, the business of saving energy, energy, the business of Tesla cars, for instance. Um, he doesn't like the idea of, of self-denial um, <laughs> in many walks of life. Um, but I think, you know, a source of great frustration that climate change cannot be seen as something positive. And he's very keen that that becomes something that's positive. And after all, what is more conservative than wanting your kid to breathe cleaner air, than wanting to save money that is currently being wasted because things aren't insulated properly that you know you harness new industries by creating regulations that outlaw things that keep old industries alive it makes so much sense on so many levels other than self-denial and self-flagellation and if you look at the positivity boris channeled from the olympics mm -hmm. i wouldn't be surprised to see we'll him see take exactly the same route on cop 26. <laughs> a bit less tired to, uh, to get there <laughs> okay well we're out of time i'm afraid thank you both very much for joining me and thank you very much for watching